going live on YouTube. Okay. Okay. Whoops. Yes. Okay, we're going to get started, everyone. So please find a seat. So welcome to Outspoken, the monthly reading series put on by the Publishing Triangle. This is the February edition because it's February. <laughs> if you didn't know that, that's okay. There's a lot going on. But, yeah, yeah. Give yourself a break. Uh, my name is Greg Newton. I am the co-founder, along with my lovely partner, Donnie Jokum, of the Bureau of General Services. It's Donnie's birthday. And I think tomorrow is Felice Picano's birthday. So <laughs> Like the birthdays. Um, uh, what did I want to say? I wanted to say just a couple words about Cecilia Gentili, um, someone we love dearly who we lost since we last met in January. Um, for those of you who don't know Cecilia or didn't know Cecilia, uh, she was a performer, activist, author. As an activist, she was very active <laughs> on behalf of sex workers, immigrants, Palestine, you name it. She was a lovely presence. Um, her book, Faltas, was uh, a finalist for a Publishing Triangle Award last year. Um, and that's when we last had her here, when she read as a finalist. Um, that video is online. So we want to just acknowledge that she is no longer with us that we miss her. Um, I also highly recommend, if you have not seen the video of the service, the memorial service that was held at St. Patrick's Cathedral, <laughs> you gotta watch it. It's so good. The right-wing Catholics are calling it scandalous, so you know it was good. <laughs> it was such a perfect send-off for her. Um, we miss you, Cecilia. Um, so the Bureau is an all-volunteer organization, and we rely on donations and book sales to keep this boat afloat. Um, so we do ask for donations. I'm going to pass around a bag that has some change in it. If you're able to throw something in there, great. If you'd rather buy some books and support us that way, that's a lovely thing to do. And if you're really feeling generous and you'd like to sign up to make a monthly donation, you can do that on our website. Uh, bgsqd.com, the letters that are all around you and on the bookmarks, um, so you can take that home. Um, so let me pass around the donation bag. You can also make a donation on Venmo, those of you watching online, um, and that's at bgsqd, and you'll see my name, Greg Newton, because I can't figure out how to get my name off of there. <laughs> Technology. Um, if you're not already on our email list and you would like to be, you can sign up for that at the back of the room or again on our website, bgsqd.com, and you'll get an email every other Monday about our many upcoming events. Um, so check that out. You can also just check out the calendar on the webpage. So before I bring Rob up here, I want to read a land acknowledgement and a call for a ceasefire. So the Bureau acknowledges that our organization operates on the unceded land of the Mansi Lenape. We encourage you to join the Bureau in signing up to make a monthly donation to the American Indian Community House's Manahatta Fund. The Manahatta Fund, according to its website, is an invitation to all settlers and non-Native people who wish to acknowledge the legacy of theft and genocide that comprise the history of New York City and the United States. And you can find out more at manahattafund.org. We also want to recognize that today is the 138th day of Israel's genocidal campaign against the Palestinian people, funded by our tax dollars 
and enabled by our government's unwavering support. We hope that you will join us in calling for an immediate permanent ceasefire, an end to the siege, and an end to the occupation in order to stop the collective punishment of Palestinians and to ensure the swift delivery of much needed food, water, medicine, fuel, and medical aid to the people of Gaza. And now, please give it up for our host, Rob Burns of the Publishing Triangle. I didn't know I was supposed to. Does that mean I have liability? Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Craig, and happy birthday, Donnie. Uh, exciting. And again, and happy almost birthday, Felice, at midnight. Um, before we get going, I brought this book up because I was sitting next to it. And Michael Thomas Ford, the author, has, <clears throat> excuse me, has joined us twice over the last couple of months, once um, virtually and once in person uh, uh, during the Outspoken series. And the reason I'm, I want to show his book and mention his name is because Michael Thomas Ford paid his $40 this year to become a member of the Publishing Triangle. And I want to encourage all of you to do that because it's only $40 a year, less than a dollar a week. And we are an all volunteer organization and we depend on that money <clears throat> to help us do what we do, promote, uh, thir thir I think we're up to 13 awards, Carol? Yeah. yeah. 13, I don't know. See, it grows every year, so it's hard to keep track. But we're up to 13 major queer pop, uh, queer literary awards that we give out now. Um, so please, if you can, that $40 means a lot. Publishingtriangle.org. Please join Felice Picano's a member. Carol Rosenfeld's a member. Many of you are members. Dan Meltz is a member. Please join us again, <laughs> just $40. And we give a free award ceremony and a free reception afterwards. So not free for me, unfortunately. <laughs> That's the beauty of not having a staff or a development arm. But okay, let's get on to the show. And I'll be boring you again with more stuff. But <laughs> okay. our first reader tonight, because she has to be first, is Kate Rounds, who is uh was doing something earlier today. Yeah, just case. And this is a great time to add this is like Bywater Night. Seven writers and three of them published by Bywater. So yep. So step it up, Kensington. Um <laughs> Kate Rounds is the author of the novel Catboat Road, pu um, published by Bywater, um, in September of 22. She's a veteran journalist, has an MFA in creative writing from Goddard College. She's a book writer, essayist, editor. She lives in Jersey City. All the best people do. <laughs> she lives without a cat. She was... <laughs> And she was in Jersey City earlier today with our Publishing Triangle board member, Emmanuel Xavier, and others to, um, well, I, I'm going to actually let her say exactly what they were doing, but they uh, they were out educating the public on how to publish, and, and they read a little bit of their work. So please welcome Kate Robbins. Want to lower that oh, thank you. <laughs> Make it really low. <laughs> <laughs> down, 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 down. There you go. Okay, so um, we all right? Ah, there you go. Uh, this is my book, Capo Road. Um, it's about a 17 year old girl who falls in love with her mother's best friend, whose name is Mrs. Forrest. And it's written in the um, first person by the teen. I led her up the back stairs to my room. My laptop, clothes, earphones, and even shoes were on the bed. I hadn't had a chance to put stuff away. It struck me that things hanging out revealed more than any pathetic revelations I might say out loud. Mrs. Forrest wandered toward a photo of me, caressing it with two fingers. You never know what it smells like in your own den, probably old sneakers and old pot smoke, not too clean sheets. 
I didn't possess any of the creams and lotions that Mrs. Forrest loved. This, the, only, the only scent beyond my own, whatever that might be, was hair gel worming slowly out of the open tube onto the dresser, which was covered with glass drives and cables. The shades were wide open, letting in the way right light from the porch across the street. The only illumination inside was my Dora the Explorer nightlight. I swept everything off the bed and pulled Mrs. Forrest onto it, kissing her and ripping the buttons of her shirt. She removed her shirt, shoes, and turned down the bedspread. We faced each other so close I got the delicious high of brandy on her breath. I want to sleep with you, she pulled me to her. The whole night, side by side, she cut my handful of breasts. Sleep, sleep. But we didn't make it till morning. We didn't make it to the next 10 minutes. Her husband, Mr. Lee Forrest, was silhouetted in the doorway. His shadow stretched menacingly against the wall. <laughs> If you really want to know what we were doing, we were at St. Peter's University talking to students about writing, and it was fabulous. And I, I suggest everybody do it because we were surprised at how um, they, they actually talked to us. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't think that was going to happen. So anyway, it was great. And thank you. Thank you, guys. Great. <laughs> I'm coming. Yeah. I'm not still learning this one. This, this one, this one trick. <laughs> <laughs> Our next reader, who also asked to read first, um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but Kate got Kate got in first, so he got bumped. And um, uh, his his name is Daniel Meltz. Um, Dan Meltz's first book of poems. It wasn't easy to reach you, which David Sedaris is calling funny, bold, and moving, will be published by Trail to Table Press a year from now. I, Greg, Donnie, I think we're going to have to get a second microphone so they can pick up the crowd noise. This is, <laughs> first of all, this is the best attended outspoken yeah. reading we've had. Secondly, what an enthusiastic audience. Unfortunately, People that are watching on YouTube are just hearing me right now, really. So, but um, this is, I mean, it's great. And um, where was I? Oh, yes. Uh, Dan's been in an American Poetry Review, Best New Poets 2012, Salamander. I almost wrote, wrote that as Santander. I forgot our bank account. <laughs> um, Upstreet and uh, lots of other journals. He's a retired technical writer and a teacher of the deaf living in Manhattan between Lady Gaga's childhood building and James Baldwin's adulthood building. <laughs> and let me add one more thing before I bring him up. I met Dan, was it the, it was probably the December, was it, where, where is Dan, where, oh, there you are. Was it, it was January, okay. Um, Drunken Careening Writers event that our friend Kathleen Warnock puts on every month. Um, I hope many of you have gone before or read before. I know Carol and I and others have, and Felice. Um, get on that mailing list. And Kathleen will be reading next month, but more on that later. Please welcome Dan Reynolds. Thank you, Rob, and thanks for uh, including me, and thank you, Felice, for introducing me to everybody. So um, I'm going to read a few poems. I'm not going to be as brief as Kate, but <laughs> now this first poem is um, is about a gay bar uh, that used to be around here, uh, the Ninth Circle. Some of you might remember it. Um, I wanted to read it because it's, it was only a couple blocks from here, and uh, I spent my a lot of my late teens and 20s at that place 50 years ago. Uh, so this poem is called I Was a Tool of the Ninth Circle <clears throat> it, was it was important to find a seat We had too many arms And to nurse a beer for at least an hour The waiters were always circling the tables If you were lucky to get a table And clearing away the empties of the, Or the bottle with a swallow At the brown glass bottom Whether you sat or stood And looked away at someone cute 
You were thrilled when a he-man hunk of a stranger bought you a beer, but that wasn't often. Mixed drinks were not in your budget, but if your mother sent you a 20 for your birthday, you sprang for white Russians, one for you and one for Johnny Pompadour. <laughs> you would hang out with jumpsuited college friends or that silly gaggle of Bensonhurst hairdressers with their mullet cuts and chipped black nails and laugh a lot and gossip. Sometimes Taylor Mead would show up, the last of the Warhol superstars, and pass around a joint or bum a cigarette. And you'd order a salad. Yes, they sold salads. Or tell a joke or wonder if Richard Gere was gay. And meanwhile, wait for a fearless someone to pick you up and take you home, full of romance and desperation. <laughs> that was Ninth Circle. I love that place. Um, this one is called, I'm only going to read four poems. This is the second one. It's called <laughs> Variations on a Theme by McFadden and Whitehead. <clears throat> I was panning a lovesick video camera across West 57th Street, up that rise past the bygone Playboy Theater and gothically sooty Carnegie Hall. I was busy immortalizing wiglet meringues and patchwork jackets and salacious looks over Ariel Ness's sunglasses, although the sky could not have been queasier, a sun-blocking butternut tragedy color as a garbage tornado sent a Milky Way wrapper and a daily news with a mafia headline up toward the walk don't war contraption. <laughs> I managed my progress with no body to contain me, just the whir of the super eight in my brain and the grace of anonymity as I angled down eight, where not one face took a look at me, only clouds pirouetting out of gutters and stovepipes as traffic played a rhythm on a hundred year old manhole cover. Luckily, I was tall already, even at age 14, so at least I enjoyed the delusion of a presence. Though it wasn't until I moved in with Rick a few years later, Rick X, who would become that public access porno phenomenon, cantankerous, absurdly macho, down with the government Ricky, that I learned I had an actual body. It had something to do with his filthy imagination and his stubby Crayola fingers. But then I forgot I had a body when he dumped me at the Gilded Grape only five months together. I never wanted it to end because I failed to seduce a sailor for a Valentine's threesome. I remembered I had a body again in April 1980 when I danced and stripped and sold the same body for a couple of weekends and the, weeks in and the week in between. Not as dismal as it sounds. But I regressed to the mean of misery after that when I reconnected with Florindo of the scissored jaw and back acne, who did everything he could to crush my body. What exactly was it that I wanted him to crush? Why was it so gratifying to fetch about him? <laughs> then at the boy bar, a few months later, I picked up Pierre. No accident, he was lean and happy. I determined it would only take just this much to change absolutely everything. And we made love all night, no sleep whatsoever, full strangers, he and I. He cried twice. I cried three times. A magical glow that still radiates off those pages in my diary to this day. I exodus from that love nest, however, lickety split, like Moses out of Egypt. It's just matzah and water for me. I'm serious. <laughs> Until a couple days later, back on 57th, after Pierre had kept calling me, after he actually tracked me down at work and asked me what was wrong with me, that I didn't want to see him again. I mean, I could understand, he said with his Paris accent, if you were incredibly riche or incredibly handsome, but even zen. <laughs> and like a moose in a heat wave who never... It's Moose Body. I understood I was here in New York, as here is the soot and the solo building. And I knew where, the, where that insight came from, from the literal hereness of my actual body, from Pierre's participation in that actual body. And so I saw him again, maybe 11 times total, because no, sadly, we never fell in love. But his challenge took root in me and became my own portion. And so to those who say, there's never any answer. There ain't no answer. That's the answer. I say in all probability you gave up too soon. 
Okay, two, two more to go. This one, I some of you have heard this a million times, but a lot of you haven't heard this, and I, I like reading this poem. It's called Narcoleptic Karaoke. Narcoleptic <laughs> Karaoke. Um, I used to make lists of the names of my friends. John, Larry, Ernest, Jeffrey, Mitch, Gene, Steve, Lee. Then every couple of days, I rewrite the list on a scrap of paper or a blank page in my diary. Over time, the list would change. John, Sally, Jeffrey, Bob, Steve, Mitch, Amy, Bill. Sometimes the list was lined up with my groceries. Paul, coffee, John, yogurt, David, <laughs> shrimp, meat, Jeffrey, tomato juice. <laughs> or lined up with my groceries and the movies I'd seen. Tom Weecher, a room with a view. Amy Chickpeas, tuna, blue velvet. <laughs> yeah. I used to write down everything we talked about in therapy. You're full of murderous rage. I can't hear you. Then I burst into tears. She's right. She's right. As much verbatim as I could remember. A one I play three times a week. I wrote down everything I saw and who I went with. I recorded record highs and lows and the names of the trees and the cocks I'd sucked. I recorded orgasm, sick days, days I'd smoked pot, the length of the movie, the number of hours since I'd last seen Howie, since I first met, met Linwood, since recorded rain had fallen, inches of snow, days above 90, the 10 most populous, the driest, the loneliest, the loneliest, the one list, the on list, the off list. Eventually, I threw them out. Eventually, you wake up startled. What are you keeping lists for? What's with all the ledger domains? It wasn't a question of what to remember the diving birds told me, but who to forget. You are such a nice crowd. <laughs> okay, so this is the last one is called On Quitting Therapy. It's a little long, just like the therapy. <laughs> Uh, okay, when quitting therapy. <clears throat> In the early days, it was always there, like the rattling clack of a downtown sea. I'm going to quit, I'm going to quit, I'm going to quit, I'm going to quit. A relentless, defensing, assuring refrain I could fall away into when you got too close or told me I was awful, or as you put it, arrogant, then dispensing a dose of your maddening silence as a way to encourage me or torture me really into focusing on the nonsense I've been prattling about. Bits of foolish and personal party time chatter about Hannah and her sisters, about the lost language of cranes or some flatulent babble of too much agreement. Oh God, yes, no, I know what you're saying. Or savage understanding, uh-huh, uh-huh. But I came back anyway, next appointment, 10 minutes early. Always uh, always with the countdown clacking away inside me, palpitating through me. The countdown to our time is up. I'm going to quit. I'm going to quit. I'm going to quit. I'm going to quit. Until really not that long ago, when I realized how connected we were and bound up in the progress and the failing and the ending, and ending with every session. You, my release valve, rock, recaller, role model, time waster, yes, sorry, so much waste, and the sympathetic, beautiful, perfect comprehension of the way life goes. No longer trapped in an echoing snake pit, I could feel we were close for as long as I wanted. No more melodramatic scrambling for the emergency button. What a change that was. And now this, after 38 years, 57% of my life on earth, and that's not counting the five earlier therapists, because of, <laughs> because of that one sleepless night, three weeks and a couple days ago, when I knew I had to leave you, and I knew precisely why, because of something Mike had said about the shame I bring to sex. And it's not like you hadn't helped me with that, because you yourself were full of tenderheartedness and playful sexual wisdom. But of course, there was the taint of your, yes, I can say it now, your slapped on soul food therapist understanding and your predictable, unstoppable, though actually highly reasonable 1890s calendar of psychodynamic misery. But in the end, you could only pilot me here. 
to three weeks and a couple days ago, which has nothing to do with, well, a little to do with the broader topics of the trap of psychoanalysis and the loop of endless vengeance. Though it's easy to see how my surprising you by dumping you looks a lot like the way my father surprised me back in 1967. But I refuse to prepare us for the end of my treatment by dismantling my decision over the course of 20 supplementary winding down sessions because I remembered how you used to debate and dismantle. How do you feel? Oh, I don't know. Like you've cut me down to size? Whenever I wanted to taper down from four sessions to three, from three sessions to two, and how I'd have to uncharacteristically raise my voice when you bet on that pony and say, listen, Ellen, this is what I'm doing as of today. And there was nothing for you to come back with. We hadn't signed a contract. In the end, you weren't my father. So there we were in the middle of the shock of it, the middle of the session, which was all of a sudden the end of the session, the end of all our sessions. But in the final, ha ha, in the final analysis, I can't anatomize what happened in the know-it-all style of the peevishly uninitiated, that you go around in circles, that that's how they rook you, around and around the same five topics and around and around the same five fixations and two or three disgusting scenes involving mother and father or father or mother or mother and rabbi, and you never get anywhere. <laughs> Because I'm in total uncircular agreement with you that every time you talk about it, whatever it is, it isn't the same because time has passed and time by definition is a progression of understanding or a progression of distancing, whichever you decide on. And I know that with every passing week, I moved closer to the goal of eternal bodily comfort. But then that sleepless night, it came to me. I don't want to dwell in dysfunction anymore. It had devoured my life without my really knowing it. Thank you. Else. Now, you see the kind of talent, if you listen to Felice Picano and you go to drunken careening writers, you see the kind of talent you can uh, be exposed to. <laughs> Our next, speaking of referral, by the way, I mean, it was a referral from Felice and from Kathleen Warnock that uh, brought us to Dan, and thank God for that. Uh, another referral brought us to our next reader, the brilliant writer and cartoonist, a uh, graphic novelist, Eric Orner, said, you have to have Kathy Wolf read for you. So Kathy Wolf down in DC is uh, on, on uh, our video right now. Kathy is the recipient of the 2024 William Meredith Poetry Award. She's been nominated for, for, and she's also been nominated for the Pushcart Prize. Her work has appeared in Poetry Magazine, The New York Times, and other publications. Her most recent poetry collection is The Porpoise in the Pink Alcove, which is out from Forest Woods Media Productions this year. Um, Kathy Wolf was a 2008 Lambda Literary Emerging Writer Fellow, and she's a longtime contributor with the Washington Blade, the acclaimed LGBTQ paper. Please welcome from Washington, D.C., because we're in the Zoom era, so thank God for that. We can be a little, we get out of the room a little bit. Please welcome Kathy Wolf. Uh, thank you so much. I'm really honored to be doing this. And so thanks to you and to Zoom, and a shout out to Eric Orner for connecting me with you. Um, so this first poem is a kind of breakup poem that was really fun to write. It's called Mia Culpa. Mia Culpa. I let your I let I let your cat out of the bag, set your chickens home to roost, made your hair stand on end, took the wind out of your sails, huffed and puffed and blew your house down, crossed your heart and bled it dry. If only you had smiled at me that summer night. And this next poem, I'm moving along with the speed of light on my iPad. 
I grew up in Southern New Jersey and one, I don't, I don't really like that much about Southern New Jersey because of, you know, all the fun stuff that happened if you were queer, like in the early sixties or whatever, and a kid, but I love the amusement park. So this poem is called Ferris wheel, Ferris wheel. When I was five, I was sure God lived at Riverview beach, our town's amusement park. If I'd created the universe, that's where I'd hang out. Why bless the world from inside a dark, musty church? Perform miracles and hospitals filled with blood, nasty smells, babies' cries. When God could comfort the sick on the merry-go-round, greet everyone with the kiss of peace in the tunnel of love. Duke it out with Satan on the bumper cars. Take confession at the top of the Ferris wheel. Forget about the loaves and the fishes. White bread and tuna aren't, aren't a treat for most kids, I thought. God would turn the loaves into cotton candy, the fishes into hot dogs. When everyone had gone on the last ride at closing time, Lazarus would leap through the funhouse doors. And this next poem, I think we all, if you're queer, you have a little story about, you know, your first experience in a bar. So this poem is about uh, a first experience at a bar. It's called Baby Dyke, Baby Dyke. I never thought I'd crush on that joint. White cane in hand, I stood on the steps in the dark, waiting for the bar door to open. Baby Dyke, I flew in on the sweat. I baby Dyke, I flew in on the sweat of cigarettes. My blind eyes couldn't see what the drag kings were wearing, the the strobe lights, nut dishes, or where you or where you could go to pee. I couldn't tell if Sappho smiled or winked at me, but my feet grooved to the lavender beat. Smoke rings flirted with my hair. I bumped into the girl who 16 years later would become my wife. I didn't know that then. I only knew I'd lost my heart to that sweaty, smoky, holy place. If you're like me, you probably have had more than you'd like to remember it's the experience of overhearing one side of a cell phone conversation on a train or a movie or whatever. This poem is called Strangers on a Train. Strangers on a Train. My mother believed in Hollywood endings. If your husband left you and your children with no money and took your dogs, a shining night would sweep in with buckets of cash and two French poodles named Champagne in Beignet. If you died far too young from a disease that turned your garble-like face into a robot-esque mask and your sparkling wit into dull mush, you would live forever in a biopic or a beloved camp classic. I think of this on Mother's Day. I'm on a train. I'm clean, a man says into his phone. I'm at the other end of the car, trying not to hear his story. I'm out of rehab, he says, going to Providence to find my mom. She might be dead. I haven't seen her since I was eight. He mumbles something about being hungry, getting a job. I don't want to be in this movie, even as an extra. What lines could I say to add to the scene? How could I give this guy a Tinseltown ending? My mother is my screenwriter, but she deserts me here. Oops, I'm 
looking for a poem and my iPad is, okay, it is moving. I thought my iPad was going to freeze on me, which would be just like something to happen in February. Okay, uh -huh. this next this next poem is my total title poem of my book. And my publisher said I had to be selfishly self-promoting and hold my book up. So I'm helping, I'm holding it right side up. Um, have no idea if anyone can see it over, spoon, over Zoom, but I've held it up. So this poem, uh, um, I try to be a good girl, so to speak. Um, I love publishers. I publish your book. Um, so this poem takes place in Provincetown, which I, I love. Okay. It's called The Porpoise in the Pink Alcove. On the yellow sand, outside the lobster shack in Provincetown, sucking pewter-hued belly clams, with their eyes stuck in each other like honey on hot, sticky buns, our legs entwined like silly putty. A porpoise snorted, sniffed, put its hand, put its head on our hands, looking for food or affection. Maybe in some sand dune dream, the creature strolled down streets, genuflected to drag queens in gold lame gowns as long and winding as the staircase in All About Eve, as sultry as Barbara Stanwyck in Double Indemnity. We weren't sure. We only knew we had our pink alcove. Moving with the stream speed of light again. Um, okay, sorry about this, folks. This next poem is called, uh, well, I should say in my next life, I want to be a cartoonist. So I'm just alerting everybody in the afterlife is that there is one. This next yeah. poem is called In Heaven, and it's for Anne. In Heaven, in Heaven, you tell me nobody reads the paper except ex-jocks who can't get enough of sports and morbid angels who love obits. Printers never jam, the sick call in well, and you only eat spinach on feast days. Daffy Duck and Betty Boop are the highest ranking politicians. Today, on your birthday, you'll become the cartoon you always wanted to be, though you never asked to be animated. And my, this last poem is called, This is Just to Say, and it's after William Carlos Williams. This is just to say, I am gay. It is so sweet. I have eaten the plums, which so many, so often, say I should not eat, especially at breakfast. I bite their lavender skins, not caring, as so many still say I should. If the juice spurts on the plate everywhere, I do not ask for forgive I do not ask for forgiveness. I am so gay, it is so sweet. We carry plums in our gro in our grocery bags one summer night. We remember how we met at the beach that June day. We wanted to cool off in the ocean after the pride after the pride parade. Being proud can make you sweat. Dykes, two guys yelled, spitting on us, throwing our groceries on the sidewalk. Ants circled the plums. Alone now, I still eat the plums, succulent, sweet, that so many still say we shouldn't eat. I'll savor the taste as thugs and khakis, gun for our taste buds, target our flavors. I am gay. It is so sweet. 
Th thanks so much for having me. Thank you, Kathy Wolf, from jo for joint for for that great reading and for joining us from Washington D.C. Uh, wonderful to have you. Spread the word that um, your fellow queer D.C. writers should be part of the series. <laughs> and because uh, you know, I mean, honestly, since the pandemic, where the publishing triangle is no longer just a New York City group anymore. <laughs> We don't have to have those horrible. Oh, great. We don't have to have those horrible um, mailing parties that we used to have. Um, Carol, like, Carol, it was like, oh, I mean, you know, back then we, back then in 2019, um, <laughs> we, you know, to get ready for our, our, um, our award ceremony, which I'll talk about a little bit later. But to get ready, we would all sit there, and it was all, not many of us, six, seven at the most, um, and sit there and stamp and lick envelopes and fold and stuff and blah, blah, blah. And it was really, you know, we, we had fun. We had, did a lot of gossiping and stuff, but it was still like drudgery. And now we're doing it all electronic. And thanks to Zoom, we are out there to the whole world, real, at, the old, at least the English-speaking world. Actually, I shouldn't say that. Ger we're Gerard Cabrera, wave. Gerard, who is one of our board members, by the way, um, it's actually Stan, so people can see you. At the beginning of this month, Gerard put together our first bilingual reading. Um, and, you know, we're, we're getting out there more and more, the publishing triangle, and but it's still at the same low price, but I'll talk about that again in a moment. So thank you, Kathy. And also, I should probably, as long as I mentioned mentioned Gerard, I don't see any other board members except for our chair, Carol Rosenfeld. You all know Carol. And then before I get to our next reader, one other thing, I think maybe two other things. Oh, is Kathy still on? Yeah. <clears throat> Kathy, can you still hear me? I guess I'm just curious. This is just me. I could do this personally with you, but you know why not do it with an audience? <clears throat> Where in southern New Jersey was your uh, were your roots? I grew up in a little town called Salem, about half an hour from Wilmington, Delaware. Okay. Um, we had cows in the back of our house, and people grew corn, and there was mosquitoes and I got um, I hear ice I hear, cream and near. I have Millville roots, um, so I hear you. But, uh, oh, I know where Mill. Okay, yeah. Well, we can yeah. talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. I knew I liked you. I mean, we have yeah. <laughs> gone through. Yeah, well, the history. Wow. You, you do. So thank you, Kevin. <laughs> um, I mean, the yeah. publishing triangle and the South Jersey triangle. We should do it. Yeah, we'll do a publishing. We'll we'll go there. Maybe maybe just to get like cosmopolitan, and instead we'll go to Vineland. Okay. So, <laughs> oh my God, that's where my grandparents live. Oh wow! <laughs> All right, now we'll dress up as bluebirds of Hamilton for Halloween. <laughs> All right, um, and uh, okay, now that Kathy and I are done with our conversation, sorry, <laughs> I love you. Um, our next reader, Jerome Ellison Murphy, is a poet and critic based in New York City. He earned his MFA from the Creative Writing Program at NYU, where he currently serves as undergrad um, serves as undergraduate programs manager. His poetry appears in Lit Hub, Narrative Magazine, Bellevue Literary Quarter, a uh, quarterly, sorry, Spunk Arts Journal, and more. And he was recorded for NPR as I didn't know this is great. He was recorded uh, for NPR as part of the Poetry Well Performance Series. His critical writing has appeared in the Yale Review, LA Review of Books, Publishers Weekly, and elsewhere. Please welcome Jerome Ellison Murphy. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here on a cold uh, February evening. You could be anywhere else, and this is why we love New York City. So thank you for being here. Um, thank you, Rob, for the invitation. 
it's really great to see so many familiar faces here. Um, happy birthday. Happy birthday to the Bureau also, which has been going for how many years, you guys? 11, 11 years. And, uh, you know, I remember when you were in another space over on the Lower East Side. So give it up to these guys first. A general happy birthday. Um, and uh, I will also just second Rob's call for volunteers for the Publishing Triangle. I have volunteered for the Publishing Triangle. It was a great experience. I don't know if I ever did one of the mailing parties. I may have and repressed the memory. <laughs> um, so anyhow, but it's a great organization. What they do is great. The awards are fantastic. I go every year. So um, thank you for all that you do. Um, so Kathy inspired me. I am also going to read a Provincetown poem. And in general, I like to travel in my poems, um, maybe because it's a lot cheaper than <laughs> traveling. Um, but this is called Apparition of a Round Trip Ticket, set in Provincetown. Still not arrived, but step from the ferry, phantom of aspiration, you must haunt Commercial Street. Among these not yet, or once, or too long coupled, the still to be rich, these artists and others sick of living on their wits in the city. Sober now, see your old self on his knees just outside the cafe. Still dry heaving, still green. Five years ago, six. But today, even pets got sick on the boat. Here, dear, let bad taste distract. Faux stone bracelets, oversized hats, Indian pudding on the menu at the Mayflower. What should last here? Polished tungsten, scratch resistant, the two rings Colin buys, having taken Jeffrey's size. Placeholders, he says. All down Commercial Street, placeholder things, things and provisions, O oh, provisional town. Colin, visibly anxious now, and you, feeling dark as Penelope's shroud, trade jokes about the fairy of death with Lily, elegant singer, black, trans, fellow survivor of six-foot waves. Your glasses clink at shipwreck lounge, where third parties circle these inner circles, burnishing furniture of sturdier lives. At the coffee shop, one Jamaican seasonal worker offers you small talk, cordial, curt. She's not your auntie. This is not home. Some of us folks come here for a season, blown ashore by rougher drafts than yours. But let that yes haunt the crooked, leaf-shadowed path where Colin kneels while Jeffrey stands, both parallel with Commercial Street, unzeroing the rings, a beautiful thing. And just ahead, Pleasant Street waits, Manicured, flagged, nautical chic, restored houses, grand, over 900 grand. J and C clasp their glittering hands as you turn a corner to encounter this old acquaintance, now a full-time painter outside Liz's cafe. Friendlier than recalled, also more bald. He's been softened, humility's brush touches all. And all along commercial, you are an item, aware, still hawked, still broken up, not yet spoken for, but finally unbought, even in short shorts and souvenir hoodie, flexing those calves and new kicks. Markets unpredictable, stocks fall or rise. Fridge wind blows off the glittering bay. The ferry comes and goes. Three days, then Colin gets his call. It's go time to fill in at Carnegie Hall. Mad scramble at 5 a.m. A drive back with these engaged, engaging friends, feeling present once more and alone. The city gleams. Now you are all arriving slowly, buoyed by Collins' baritone. Waiting out there somewhere, your return ferry station. This unused ticket, a whisper of return. I tear it up to reject your resignation. Um, so I think we'll travel now to Jamaica. I mentioned the Jamaican seasonal worker in that poem. Those sort of moments are interesting and, and, and rather fraught for me as someone um, whose mom is an immigrant from Jamaica. And in my work, I've been exploring a bit what it's like to be a queer person with that heritage. Very fraught. I've actually been to Jamaica and had to go back in the closet to travel there because of the degree of homophobia, which I think is well known. So um, this is a little bit about that. Um, it's called Apparition of Arms. Growing into yourself, nearly folded like so, watching all these men you are not, these men who might take you out if they knew. Once in La Tournelle, 
Katie, you slow dance with men who slow danced with men who nonetheless might take you out if they knew. You sat through a sermon in a mountain church surrounded by exquisitely turned out parishioners who if they knew would take you out too. So now among the tall grasses above Jamaican bauxite trails, watch men like thieves, hunters up slopes so steep a vehicle will finally refuse to move. Men whooping because somebody's camera cold shot has caught the antlered buck rarely spied the island. To be grown means seasoning interactions with the spice of expertise, means warn the American he'll tear off an arm clutching that zip line between banyans and high silk cottons, means fishing to cook fresh right here on the beach, or seasoning jerk pork into world-class savor in a shop off the road between North and South Coast, means you can fix the door on your neighbor's truck dented by runaway cattle, means on the cusp of old age, you are still feeding live crocodiles by hand in a private preserve along the White River. Means when steering a raft along a river haunted by mangroves like pirate ghosts, you recognize custard apple, the wild treasure, and know this is called mountain apple. Or perhaps you have so long been diving in Frenchman's Cove, your brined and blackened physique is segmented as the lobster you hawk at prices to wrangle the coastal locals. At times of dispute may arise, and caught in testosterone's ever spread net, you might be the local disputant, a Jehovah's Witness ex-cop alluding as the argument builds to the rifle in the trunk of your car. You know the steps of this dance until someone calls you fatty man, throws out that poisonous dart, and now an outsider steps forward like a dancer cutting in, quelling the mutual passion, snuffing the spark. Back at home, cooling off, ask your American guests, how could Obama let gay marriage happen? You have learned the way from Ochi to Buff Bay, learned the way from Turtle Towers to Green Grotto Caves, and how to decline the scenic cave tour because you know this rate is for tourists. Don't they see you, a true Jamaican, and who are you all trying to fool? At the roadside, you haggle down the cost of guinea that have clearly been too long off the tree because now they look like marbles. Doesn't groan mean brandish your knowledge, switchblade like so. Doesn't groan mean a man who will never be taken. <laughs> sorry these folks are all kind of depressing but, uh it is what it is um let's see okay yes this is also set in jamaica there's a um a plant that i think you you don't really see in north america too much but it's called mimosa puta mimosa pudica or sensitive plant and you touch it and it sort of folds up it's not predatory it sort of hides and protects itself and in jamaica they call it shame old lady and that's their name for it and so um this is that poem uh, it's called Shame Old Lady. And um, there is a sort of prayer theme running through these poems, a sort of religious theme. And um, it seemed appropriate, you know, we were passing around that donation and I felt, oh, this is almost like a church collection. And, you know, there's such a nice spirit in here. It almost feels like a church. So aptly enough, Shame Old Lady. Never takes much fingertips touch or beak brush of prey probing bird to trigger survival's minutest nerves to elicit the cringe and colorless blush by which she makes of herself a sheltering purse of frills folding in on this prickle down scene, her prayer so thin as to be silent, though seen. Sub-equatorial native, pan-tropical now, how this country does christen you, shame, old lady. Hereafter, the finical fronds reemerge at the lay of fine green times. And what slim heed take the reverent O lady watching prayer clasp these hands on the short hour only. Okay, I think I will end with this short poem. You know, I don't really love autobiography, but um, it's where the material is. And this is uh, one poem that sort of travels um, in place. It's called Man With No Name. <laughs> The hour is late, the television light chiseling mom's face beside me, and a chiseled young Eastwood treks through his 60s spaghetti westerns once again, a lone matchstick striking against the sky's blue. Wish I could remember his name, my father says now and then, recalling our own white savior, an Italian in far off Terrania, near that tower that leans as if narcoleptic on invisible feet. Once, the field hospital there in Camp Darby, a newborn kept falling back to oblivion, refusing love, light, speech, 
till accidental vigilante, the doctor came through. Passing by for paperwork on his one day off, he could see Sergeant's newborn was hypoglycemic. Blood lacking sweetness, no one else had known what to do with the slump, the addiction to sleep, the danger of blue. For weeks, infant Jay slept in a hospital box, a specimen splayed, an electrode headed, sucrose infused, dreaming, who knows? These days when sleepless, that is, when least immersed in our absurd shared dream called routine, I remember a dual citizenship I maintain in this country of the living that happenstance waved me into. A country shaped like a boot, kicking at waves, kicking fate, and how to deserve it, the everyday feast. The sun sets beauty that shatters off coast, all the sweetness of photographed vistas, rock slopes of Haiti's Mont Bouton, the vestigial maroons of Jamaican bauxite slopes, the black sands darkening Iceland's southern coast, where I warmed a lover's hand, lastingly, I thought, as Swiss Alps hold the sky and weigh the world. Can you earn any of it? Earn a single visit to Italy or Spain, where these men on screen acting good, bad, and ugly long decades ago are vying once again for bounty, for status, and gold. This is your bonus round, all of this, remember and remembering just for a moment to stop breathing. Soon I fall back to oblivion or to dream on this couch beside mom, watching a face half darkness, half light, in a high definition afterlife, unforgiven, chiseled by weather, Elder Eastwood mutters on, deserves got nothing to do with it. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, I want a free phone. Uh, <laughs> someone leave their phone up here? Okay. Uh, and thank you, Jerome. Um, Don't go through the photos. I can't. <laughs> Too late. I, um, I, I honestly can't believe I've known Jerome for like 15 years, and um, one of us hasn't gotten any older. That one, that one isn't me, but... <laughs> Anyway, okay, I got my Medicaid card A card in my wallet. So, um, our next reader, uh, I asked actually, I stole her biography from um, her website, and except for it was written for her second novel. And then, of course, I neglected to ask until she arrived tonight what her second novel was because, you know, wouldn't mention it in the bio for the book she was trying to sell. So, I learned my lesson. I knew I learned I learned a new lesson every time I do this. Lisa Gitlin is a novelist living in Brooklyn, New York. Her debut novel, I came out for this, was awarded. <laughs> was, I know, wasn't it? Isn't that a great title? Was awarded the Independent Publisher Book Award, um, gold medal in both the humor and LGBT fiction categories. Her second novel, the one I had to ask her tonight what the title was. Postcards from the Canyon, and she's currently working on her third novel. Please, she just finished. I am, I am like so far behind on this whole thing. I'd like you to welcome our second by water novelist of the evening, Lisa Gitlin. Lisa. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Hi, everybody. Hi. Jerome, uh, I'm going to Jamaica next month. <laughs> I, I, but I'm not, I'm looking forward to it. I, I <laughs> keep me up for anything. Going to the grill, the yeah. Seven Mile Beach, so it's going to be fun. Anyway, um, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Hi, everybody. It's so wonderful to hear poems. I don't know that it's touching to me that people are still writing poetry <laughs> in this technocratic society. It's wonderful. Really enjoyed it. That was, I enjoyed yours too. Okay, so um, this is my second novel, Postcards from the Canyon. And uh, it's it's a book within a book. It's I guess you describe it as autofiction. Uh, the main character, the narrator, is kind of based on me, but she's not me. And there are a lot of characters that are based on real people, but the things that happen are completely fictional. So, um, but it's a book within a book. In other words, it, it's 
narrated by this uh, aging New York writer who's based on me. <laughs> yeah. And then um, she's writing, she's writing a, 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 a book about growing up in the 60s. So it was kind of tricky to weave the two stories together. But I'm going to just read this speak this and 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 Joanna just has recently lost her mother so she's a little crazy so I'm just going to read you from the uh the beginning of the book can you guys hear me yeah okay okay um it's now remember this is fictional <laughs> okay it's 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 a hot summer afternoon, and I'm sitting at McElroy's on 4th Avenue in Brooklyn, which is underneath one of those little Mexican kitchens where you can get a meal for about three bucks. McElroy's is my neighborhood bar. It's clean and cozy and old, a cross between a dive bar and a respectable saloon, and it's run by an old Irish dude who right now is pouring me another shot of Jack and feeling sorry for me because I'm old and drunk and female, which spells pathetic when you're out drinking by yourself. <laughs> I, I do feel pretty pathetic because my mom died three weeks ago and it was awful, just awful the way it happened. She was 90 and people think, well, that's okay then. But barely more than a month ago, she was one of those healthy and stylish 90 year olds getting her hair done every week and driving her Chevy Caprice around her suburban Cleveland neighborhood and going to her Yiddish club and to lectures and concerts and lunches with her girlfriends who were still alive. And then she had some trouble urinating and was admitted to the hospital with a kidney infection. And I drove to Cleveland as fast as I could. She has four kids, but I'm the oldest and the one she depends on. And I spent a week frantically monitoring haphazard medical interventions by random people. And then they performed this invasive procedure on her to stabilize her kidney function, quote unquote. And the next day she was moaning in pain, but they insisted on discharging her anyway. I begged them to let her stay at least another day, but they said they couldn't justify it to the bastard HMO that made all the decisions <laughs> about her medical care instead of her doctors. So I drove to the rehab facility to wait for her. And when they brought her there on a stretcher, she was unconscious and an hour later she was dead. Apparently the cap they used to keep the stuff from spilling out from the procedure broke and all these toxins got into her system. I was in shock through the funeral and the shiva, and I'm still in shock, and I don't even know why I'm writing this because it just happened, and it's not a good idea to write about the death of your mother when it just happened. You have no distance from it. You're just ejaculating words, except I'm a writer, and I think I have to write, 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 but at least I'm in this nice bar, and I can drink, which makes me feel... <laughs> <laughs> which makes me feel a little more in control of my life, which doesn't make any sense under ordinary circumstances, but your mom dying is not ordinary. It only happens once and it changes everything. You're like someone who's been struck by lightning and will never totally recover. My best friend, Molly, just left the bar after getting drunk with me, but she had the good sense to leave when she could still walk. And she, <laughs> and, and she tried to get me to go with her, but I did don't feel like going back to my apartment at the moment, even though I love where I live, which is a pretty old tenement on Third Avenue underneath the monstrous Gowanus Expressway. If you went there, you wouldn't even know what century you were in. It's a down and out dirty Brooklyn frozen in time. I don't really live there. <laughs> <laughs> I've been living in my apartment for 20 years and I never want to leave, but right now I'm kind of leery of going home because at any moment, FBI agents could show up at my door demanding to know why I haven't gotten a psychiatric evaluation. <laughs> Do you think I'm kidding? Well, I'm not. After a lifelong dedication to various forms of misbehavior, I have finally gotten the attention of the FBI. Two agents showed up at my apartment last week after I did something rash and impulsive. To tell you the truth, the whole situation just seems absurd right now. I actually started laughing about it while Molly and I were drinking, and she just stared at me with that look she gets. But when your mother dies and you're wallowing in a, a morass of grief, everything else that happened loses. What was that? Loses. Oh, that might be a... Yeah, <laughs> but when your mother dies and you're wallowing in a morass of grief, everything else that happens loses its immediacy. 
even the FBI telling you to see a shrink. You know what? They probably won't do shit to me anyway. If they really thought I was a threat to society, they would have arrested me instead of just sitting in, sitting in my apartment, giving me a hard time. It's not as though I went out to the, into the streets and did anything. I just made a very pissed off phone call to the Mike Stevens show that got everyone's underwear all in a bunch. Yeah. I probably shouldn't have turned on the TV in the middle of the day. I hate daytime TV with all these sprightly, cackling people tossing around their opinions of serious issues like beanbags. But since my mom died, I'm not following my normal routine. So I turned on the TV at 1 p.m. and there was Mike Stevens interviewing that reactionary right-wing lunatic Sandy Shrewsbury, who has the nerve to be running for U.S. Senate with her two-figure IQ. I should have, I should, I should, I should have changed the channel to avoid getting aggravated, but being aggravated is a special talent of mine. So I just sat there and watched Shrewsbury blither on and on about how people who are receiving government handouts, quote unquote, which I took to include Medicare, should not expect to have the same quality of medical care as people earning enough money to pay for the best doctors and hospitals. She said something like, if these people expect to have the red carpet rolled out for them as soon as they get sick and enter a hospital, they should move to some communist country where they believe that people on the dole should have the same privileges as the industrious worker bees. Ordinarily, I would have just reacted to Shrewsbury's babbling by yelling profanities at the TV. But I was still wigging out over the profiteering healthcare system that killed my mom, so I kind of went crazy. I snatched up my phone and called the show, and I screamed at Mike Stevens that his guest was an imbecile and that somebody should plant a bomb on, <laughs> should plant a bomb under her and blow her to the moon because she and her reactionary idiot friends are trying to ruin this country. Of course, Mike Stevens hung up on me. I got bleeped before the viewers could hear what I said, but everyone on the show heard it in, before the people watching TV, but everyone on the show heard it, including Sandy Shrewsbury. And I was so hurt, furious that I actually called back and demanded to speak to him again. <laughs> and of course the screening guy hung up on me. After I calmed down, I was kind of freaked out that I did that, but I thought, well, so what? But the next morning there was a knock on my door and I opened it to find a beefy crew cutted man and a sexy dykey woman standing there flashing their badges. I've never been a big fan of the FBI, and I wasn't very cooperative, <laughs> but they could see that I was just this irritable old Jewish lady and not some frothing lunatic making bombs <laughs> at my house. So they just ordered me to get a psychiatric evaluation and have the shrink send them a report stating I'm not crazy or violent. <laughs> For some reason, I haven't done what they told me to do. Instead, I just call all my friends and obsess about the situation, and now I'm sitting here in this bar getting drunk. Molly told me today while we were sitting here drinking that the only reason I don't want to cooperate with the FBI to, is to indulge my juvenile fantasy of going to a nice little lady's prison. Well, <laughs> well, so what? What would be so bad about going to one of those prisons like the one where they sent Martha Stewart and, and someone crocheted her a poncho? I'm really tired of taking care of myself while I'm all fucked up and disoriented, and it would be kind of nice to be told what to do all day. Maybe I would even find a girlfriend in prison. <laughs> I've only been in love once in my life, and that has worked out about as well as the Bay of Pigs invasion. But if I, but if I got locked up, maybe I could meet some tough but warm-hearted old dyke that would make me forget about this. That would make me forget about this witch I'm still in love with who doesn't want me anymore. When I tried to articulate all of this to Molly, she threw a pail of cold water on all of my assertions. She said I would hate prison, that there would be all these fascist guards ordering me around and they would make me get up at 7 a.m. and that my dormitory would be full of loud street people blasting Kanye West on their radios. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> That totally bummed me out because what if she's right? I figured that the one good thing about going to prison would be that I would have plenty of time to write my new book. I can't have Kanye West blaring in my ears while I'm trying to write. That would drive me nuts and I would end up screaming at everyone and maybe getting beat up, which would be very humiliating, especially since I pride myself on my self-possession around tough street people. It's important, it's important that I write my book with a minimum of distractions. It's going to be an autobiographical account of my growing up with a group of friends, and I have high expectations for it, even though Molly calls it 
quote, the book that's going to make me look like an idiot. <laughs> I can understand her concern since she was my best friend then, as she is now, and her character will figure significantly in the book. But it's going to be creative nonfiction, or whatever the hell they're calling it these days, and not an actual memoir, so it's not even going to be all true. Anyway, I'll show the book to her before it's published to make sure there's nothing in it that will make her hate me for the rest of our lives. I might even consider showing parts of it to to her while it's being written, since I do trust her judgment. Molly is kind of my alter ego rather than totally separate from me, so I'm hoping she'll facilitate my process and not derail it. One thing is for sure, if I don't get another book written and published pretty soon, my literary reputation will fade into oblivion. Since I make no distinction between my literary self and my actual self, what this means is that I will fade into oblivion. Yes, sir, I'll dry it up and blow away like pollen. That will be so sad. I was a freelance writer for many years and had had hundreds of articles published, but once you write a novel, you become an author and you have to keep writing books because that's what people expect. I wrote a humorous novel about gay life in New York City that was a big smash, but that was 20 years ago. And then I wrote a second book, a 9-11 novel that was accepted for publication a few months ago, but the contract negotiations were taking place during a merger with a larger house. And the new asshole marketing director decided my book was outside the parameters of their product line, and they tossed it back to me like a dirty Frisbee. Can you imagine Can you imagine how de devastated I was? It took me eight years to write that book and I was so relieved to have it accepted and I was picturing my nice big advance and great reviews and finally being interviewed on Fresh Air. And I end up with, <laughs> and I end up with bupkis. So now my agent is back to shopping it around but I can't just sit around and wait for her to call. I need to start a new project to keep from going insane. Two days before my mom died, she said, you need to write your new book and I'll read it from wherever I am. Now I'm crying again. This is so fucked up. My book is going to be about growing up in the 60s. Did I really just write that? It sounded kind of dumb, didn't it? Like what I did on my summer vacation. My, my journalist father once told me that there are no boring subjects. There are only boring writers. And he was right. I hope I'm not being boring right now because that's the worst thing you can be. It's better to be an asshole than to be boring. Norman, <laughs> Norman Mailer was an asshole and he's a modern legend. No, <laughs> no boring writers are no boring writers are modern legends. Well, I can think of one, but a lot of people don't think he was boring. And even though he wrote this 1,000 page book that was insufferable to me, but I won't mention his name again because it wouldn't be nice. Anyway, he's dead, so he won't, <laughs> so he won't do it again. <laughs> um, and that is how you sell a book, people. <laughs> uh, and which reminds me, Donnie and Greg have books to sell back there too when this is over. Um, and uh, so do get your favorite writers to <clears throat> autograph a book for you. Um, it was brilliant, Lisa. Thank you so much. Thank you. And also, fuck the Mike Stevens show and everyone's on it, especially Sandy Shrewsbury. <laughs> <laughs> All right, very quickly, we're going to get to our last two readers, but here are our announcements. First thing, I hope... People are on our mailing list, but if not, go to publishingtriangle.org. Uh, there are links there to join our mailing list. It, everything is free, okay? Including, um, oh, the only thing is not free, I'm sorry, $40 a year to become a member. What membership gives you really, let's be frank here, membership gives you the deep, warm feeling that you're supporting us. <laughs> because honestly, I'm going to give it away anyway. We are, that's just the kind of literary group we are. We, you are not excluded from everything by not being a member, but we have no staff. Um, I, and I'm not drawing any kind of bad comparisons to Lambda Literary. They're a great group, okay? But they have a staff of, I don't know, now now probably four, but no, kidding. It's probably eight, nine, ten people. Um, we have a staff of zero. Carol and I and Gerard and five other people right now are doing everything and we're doing it all. We still earn a living. Uh, and so if when you become a member, you are helping us just a little bit move that needle forward. 
Um, and get on our mailing list so you know more about this. Um, and also, uh, like, for instance, our next reading on March 13th, listen to this lineup. This is great. In just three weeks from today. And so I'll come back here, please, every one of you back, because I want to, like, fill up. We need a line outside. Look at Cheryl Head, Bill Konigsberg, Wo Chan, Kathleen Warnock, Stephen Greco, Jerry Wheeler, Mary Burns, Tim Stobierski. It's going to be an amazing evening of, of, of all kinds of great literature. Um, then, five days later, we're going to announce the finalists for the Publishing Triangle Awards this year. And the winners of our special awards, the Betty Burzon Emerging Writer Award, the Bill, Le uh, Bill Whitehead Lifetime Achievement Award, the Michelle Carlsberg Leadership Award, and the Publishing Triangle Torchbearer Award. Those will all be announced on Monday, March 18th. Then, <laughs> on right, we're going to come right back here on Monday, April 15th, and Tuesday, April 16th, because our, among our finalists for the awards, we're going to have them in here. This is something we've done now for how many, close to 10 years probably, right, Greg and Donnie? Um, but, you know, that was before Outspoken became a thing. We're going to kind of suspend Outspoken, and it'll be our finals reading again, leading up to our award ceremony on Wednesday, April 17th. Last year, Greg and Donnie accepted our leadership award. Um, well deserved. Um, but on Wednesday, April 17th, at the New School at 63 Fifth Avenue at 13th Street, we will be having our 30, I believe, 36th annual award ceremony. The award ceremony starts at 7 p.m. The reception starts immediately thereafter, free and free. Again, not drawing any comparisons with any other organization. That's just how we operate. <laughs> but I am going to say free and free. You just come, you walk in, your, your name doesn't have to be on a list. You come, you hang with us. You meet your favorite writers. You cheer for the award winners. It's like a beautiful thing. Oh, I should add too. Sorry, I'm I'm really going to turn it over to Carol in a minute to do our next reading. But I should add that among our special, uh, we are adding an award this year, which is the Jacqueline Woodson um, Children and YA YA slash Children's Literature Award. Jacqueline Woodson herself will be present to give the award. And Judy Gron will be present at our award ceremony to give out the Judy Gron Award for lesbian, lesbian nonfiction. Thank you. We have so we're getting so many awards. Um, so, and we're hoping to get some other special guest stars coming in. So it's going to be a special night. And again, it's going to be free. Um, <laughs> And then I, I finally that week is going to be a busy week for us. We have the reading Monday, reading Tuesday, award ceremony Wednesday, Thursday, a little sleep maybe, <laughs> Friday a little sleep. Saturday we're going to be at the Rainbow Book Awards with a table, and we're going to, we're going to be working during that week with Judy Brown on something else. We're not quite sure what. So I said Rainbow, Rainbow Book Fair. Oh, and then May, May, May 15th, we'll be back here. But, you know, I don't want to get too far ahead of because by then you'll be on our mailing list. So you'll be able to follow this. All the okay. Our next reader. Carol Rosenfeld is the author of The One That Got Away, published by Bywater Books. <laughs> There's Bywater Night here at Outspoken. Um, she's also currently juggling a second novel, Table for One, um, a memoir, Mapping a Country I've Never Been To, and a collection of her poetry. Carol, as I think everyone knows, but just in case you don't, Carol's also the glue that holds this all together. She's been the chair of the publishing triangle for longer than any of us really remember, but it's certainly been a good 10 years. So uh, <laughs> long, I'm sure it's been longer than that. It's been a good, it has not been all 36 years, but it's been a while. Um, please welcome Carol Rosenfeld. Okay, so can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. 
So I'm going to be reading um, from the memoir that I'm working on. Uh, thank you, Donnie. Um, it's it's really a memoir based on my caregiving for my mom. Um, and that's kind of the general topic of it. Um, she, she had dementia. So um, I'm going to be reading a couple pieces from it. These are all, I haven't really edited them or anything. I mean, this is like a first pass that I'm in, in what I've written. Um, the first one is, is section is called What's in a Name? I never really thought about my name growing up. Why would I? You told me the story of my adoption early on. You, you read me The Chosen Baby. Remember? I still have that book. Very 50s. Mr. and Mrs. Brown adopted Peter and then Mary, and they all lived happily ever after. I was curious about my birth mother, but I didn't think about it too much. I remember I, I had two dreams about her. I found Ancestry to find out, I joined Ancestry to find out about my heritage and stumbled onto a photograph of a young woman in a hat. There was a sense of recognition. And so I reached out to the person on the account and there was a phone conversation and eventually a meeting in Cape May, New Jersey. At that meeting with my birth sister, she asked if I knew why my parents named me Carol Ruth. Of course, I didn't. I'd never even asked. But she told me there had been another sister, one now deceased, whose name was Carol Ann. She was the first female child born after me. What were the odds that my parents would call me Carol Ruth and the first girl to be born after me was named Carol Ann? It seemed as though the name, my name had been part of the deal, although that wasn't specified in the adoption papers. Jewish parents tend to name their children after someone who has died. For example, my cousin Karen was named for my grandmother's seal which is why her name is spelled with a C instead of a K. So during one of my visits, I asked my mother who I was named for. She avoided answering my asking me, don't you like your name? I told her I did, but I was just curious why she decided on that name. We quickly fell into a circular discussion with me insist assuring her that I liked my name. Later, as I was getting ready to leave, and my mother was surrendering to sleep, she said, Helene knew her. Helene who married Jack, my father's cousin. I can't recall if she said anything else. Originally, I had been told that my grandmother, Sarah, had been involved, which did not surprise me as she involved herself in many things. As I recall, there was some sort of story about her hairdresser. I tried emailing one of Helene's two sons to find out if she was still alive, but she had died several years earlier. My birth mother married young at 17 and had a child, a boy. Her husband went to fight in the Korean War and she took her baby son to his grand uh, grandmother and stayed in Philadelphia with a relative. Somehow or other, she became involved with a man in the Coast Guard. She wrote a Dear John letter to her husband. The one, the man left, her husband returned, and the story she gave him was that my adoptive father was my real father. Many years later, when I met her husband and some of my brothers, my birth mother had eight children total, including me. He asked if my father had been in the Coast Guard. I told him my father served in Patton's Third Army in World War II, was injured in, near Metz in France, and got seasick if he went out in a fishing boat. During one of our conversations, my birth sister told me that two relatives had Alzheimer's. Going through everything with my mother, that was my big fear. I found out about a clinical trial for a drug to treat Alzheimer's, not to cure it, but slow it down. Signed up and was eventually accepted into the study. My DNA results showed an E2-E4 combination. E4 is the really scary one. 
The nurse told me E2 appeared to be a protective gene. I'm pretty sure the E42 gene came from my birth mother, but I assume the E2 came from my unknown birth father. It's odd, but I feel a connection to him, whoever he may be, because of that. <clears throat> um, this was um, actually um, something that I wrote for a memoir workshop that I took with a woman named Maggie Dominic, um, whose book, The Queen of Peace Room, won the Judy Brown Award many years ago. So she had given a prompt, and this was my response to the prompt. I chose the photographs and arranged them so my mother could see them from the recliner where she sat and from her bed. I filled her room at the assisted living facility with photographs, touchstones, visual reminders of her life. There are several photographs in <clears throat> four by six plexiglass frames that you can display vertically or horizontally. I focus on the one from their vacation in Bermuda, a 50th anniversary gift from their niece and nephew. My parents are on lounge chairs in bathing suits, the plants behind them in glorious tropical color. The sun is shining. It is one of those photographs where the smiles are real, not forced. They look happy and healthy. This is how I need to remember them. Is it the truth? One time when I was visiting my mother, she told me she had been very lonely in her marriage. What was I supposed to do with this confession? Could it be true? Or was this the dementia speaking? Because if it was the truth, I needed the lies. I thought about talking to one of her lifelong friends. Irma was dead already. She would have been my preferred choice. Mildred was still around. My my mother and Mildred had been babies together, but Mildred had her own story and I was reluctant to call her. Maybe I was afraid of what she might say. My mother believed that my father had left her for another woman. It was a theme for her, one that she returned to frequently, but my father didn't leave her, he, he died. Although he had left mentally, at least, after a series of transient ischemic attacks or mini strokes. My mother just referred to him as that guy I was married to, or that guy who left me. And each time it was like a blow. Most of the time my mother knew who I was, would always present me proudly, this is my daughter. But toward the very end, she would ask me, who are you? One time I said, I'm your daughter. And she looked puzzled, making a gesture over her stomach as though she was pregnant, replying, but I never, so I had to explain the story of my adoption, which she received with the expressions close to awe. But then came the day when she said, who are you? And I replied, I'm your daughter. And she said angrily, you're not my daughter. I know who my daughter is. Well, I guess I'm a friend then, I replied. I'll be back tomorrow. I kissed her cheek and left for home. And... <sighs> This is called BART. One day, not long after my mother became a resident at Atria, we were eating our usual lunch at one of the cafe tables when a man walked by and said, hi, I'm BART. It was more of an announcement than an invitation to conversation, but after I replied, hi, BART, he walked away. Over the next few weeks, I noticed that many people ignored him when he walked by them. There was a kind of rigidity about him, that seemed to keep people away, even though his occasional statements of, hi, I'm Bart, indicated a willingness to engage, even if only briefly. I felt badly for Bart, so I tried to be friendly when I saw him, to be the first to say hello. We almost never had a real conversation, although I, he acknowledged, if he acknowledged my hello, I might say something about the weather. As I write this, my memory of the the exact details of what happened is fuzzy. But I know that Bart came up to me and kissed me on the lips in front of my mother. I walked in with my mother into the living room in a kind of numbness. Already I was feeling that I was it was all my fault for being friendly. What did I expect? When we sat down on a sofa, my mother laughed, a kind of cackle I'd never heard from her. And she said, maybe he'll ask you out on a date. 
in a tone that was almost like a verbal leer. It was hard for me to sit there with her. I felt bereft. Who was this woman I was sitting with? Where was the mother who should have been outraged on my behalf? Gone. Was that the first time I truly understood how alone I was? I talked to someone in management about what happened. He was sympathetic, saying, give him an inch and he'll take a mile. And he promised to speak with Bart. Thank you. Carol, you're, Carol, you're going to finish that, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, Carol and I are like both, you know, we we write in, then we tell each other we're going to finish our stuff. And we will. <laughs> we're still young enough. Ah, our final reader tonight. First of all, I want to thank you guys have been a great audience. Well, not those four people. <laughs> I know people, people got to get up in the morning, believe me, I know. Um, now, this has been a great audience, and I was so, I mean, you know, look, peak, we had like probably 40 people in here, and that was like a great, I mean, filled it up. We're going to do even better in March. Um, I'm really excited about the trajectory of these outspoken readings, and I want to thank again Greg and Donnie, and one thing they didn't say, by the way, well, they hinted at it, but <laughs> you can support um, the Bureau of General Services Queer Division is a nonprofit organization, okay? So you can support them on a monthly basis, $10, $25, $50 a month. You'll never even know, well, mostly you'll never notice it. And at the end of the year, you're going to get like something like half of the back is a tax deduction anyway. Um, so think of all the good you can do. Just saying, and you can go to their website, um, B, B, Bureau of General Service, bgsqg.com, am I correct? Yeah. <laughs> and, and find out more information. But remember, they are a nonprofit. <clears throat> Our final reader of the night, Felice Picano. Felice. <laughs> Felice is the author of more than 30 books of poetry, fiction, memoirs, nonfiction, and plays. His work, and, and some of his plays, by the way, have been produced by Tassos, which is a group of the oldest um, LGBTQ plus, I'm, I'm old, so I have, to have trouble remembering all the letters I have to add, um, a theater group. Uh, this year it's celebrating its 50th anniversary and Felice's plays have been produced there and I'm on the board there and we're very excited about um, the fact that we have a history with Felice. Um, his work has been translated into many languages and several of his titles have been national and international bestsellers. He's considered a founder of modern gay literature along with other members of the Violet Quill and he also began and operated the Seahorse Press and Gay Presses of New York for 15 years. Felice's first novel was a finalist for the Penn Hemingway Award, and since then he's been nominated for and or won dozens of literary awards, and uh, he teaches at Antioch College in Los Angeles. He's a regular at the St. Sinners Literary Conference, um, which is coming up in a month, uh, not even uh, less than a month, in New Orleans, and tomorrow, our friend, the legendary Felice Picano, turns 80 years old. And uh, by the way, that's a guy with another 25 years in him, definitely. Please welcome Felice Picano. So one of the advantages of living a very long time, is that you get to see how old your books last. And I have three books that are in their mid forties and I have two in their mid thirties and they've never been out of print, which is very nice. But there are, but there are other books that have fallen out of print one way or another. And by the end of 2025, all of the novels will be back in print. And we're now working on getting all of the memoirs back in print. 
So the first memoir, Ambient Actress, The Secret Lives of Children, uh, was published in 1985. We have their copies up front. And I'm going to read you a, I put a, a new um, preface to it about it. And I'm going to read just a paragraph or something in the beginning of that preface. The envelope from, was from Her Majesty's Inland Revenue and Customs Service, located at a dock outside London, England, addressed to the publishers of Gay Presses of New York. I was one of the three owners of GPNY, I'm trying glasses, much better. So I opened the envelope and read the letter. In the politest possible language, I was informed that the 20 copies of my memoir, Ambidextrous, The Secret Lives of Children, intended for gay as the word bookstore at Russell Square, had been, quote, seized by the signatory, declared obscene, and destroyed by immolation. What? And, uh, <laughs> Since my early 20s, I had done as much as possible to protest and rebel against the society I had hoped for but wanted to reform. More than one person had told me in no uncertain terms, someday you will go too far. That day had arrived. It was March 17, 1989. This book was banned in England for years. Um, and it had a, a generally bad history. Um, even though I had two bestsellers out at the same time, that it was going around to publishers. Nobody wanted to publish it. Finally, my partners at TPNY, unknown to me, signed on to publish the book. When it was published, it was on the Christopher Street bestsellers for 17 months. <laughs> and it was picked up by um, a major mainstream house for uh, paperback, and then et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, went on. Recently, it's being reprinted here, and I have uh, had to look at it word by word because it's going from analog to digital, and so where CLs become Ds and all kinds of things happen. So I've had to read every word of it, and I've come to understand why um, it was so controversial at the time. It's the most, most ruthlessly honest book about children um, that I've ever read by anybody. Um, and it takes place in three sections. The first one was when we were 10 and 11. The next one, we were 11 and 12. The next one, we were 12 and 13. And by the age of 13, I had had considerable heterosexual sex, considerable homosexual sex. I, we had done a lot of drugs, uh, blue sniffing at that time. Um, I then was involved in a, a second relationship with a young lady, and unknowingly, there was a third person involved in it. Um, and so all of this is detailed. I'm reading from the very first section. These three young women moved into, well, girls, they moved into our uh, middle class 1950s Long Island neighborhood, and they were known as the Flaherty sisters. There were three of them. 9, 10, and 11. This is the Flaherty Club. Two days later, Edward told me that another party was to be held the following weekend, and I was invited. My first visit to the Flaherty house. Within an hour, once the girl's aunt, Selma Flaherty, had stumped up the chairs, the stairs to her bedroom, we three boys and four girls were left for our own devices. Spin the bottle was quickly run through and discarded for a new game, to me at least of who could kiss the longest. Kate, the youngest, disliked this game and was excused to go play with dogs upstairs. <laughs> the rest of us settled down on large duck-colored pillows around the finished basement to play. George and Susan claimed victory. Edward and Karen Lucas came in second. Beth and I, timid, as we were still relative strangers, last. Our drinks had all been gulped and refilled during the kissing contest so we felt a bit high, especially in the winter airlessness of the steam-heated basement. Sweaters were soon re removed. The girls wore brassieres. We boys took off our shirts. Then we switched partners to begin the kissing game again. This time, someone dimmed the lights. I lay down on a pillow with Karen and began to kiss more comfortably, more confidently, now that I knew what was expected. We kissed for a very long time. When I looked up to declare Karen and I the winners, it suddenly seemed as though I were in another room. 
one where the contest was long forgotten, replaced by another far more intense game. The other girls' trainer's bras were on. George had his hands inside Beth's skirt, and Edward Young's zipper was wide open, one of Susan's hands moving around within. I, too, somehow managed to get Karen's bra off, but she resisted my otherwise fumbling attempts. These facts do not describe the weightlessness, the flushed breathlessness I experienced. I did not know that the other boys were also unclear as to what this was all leading up to. I did know that our main interest lay in some unknown point beneath, between, below, somehow within. If asked, I couldn't say what it was or what I would do when I found it. <laughs> then we heard footsteps on the floor above. Selma walking to the bathroom, flushing a toilet. This caused us to stop moment momentarily and look up from what we were doing. It was then that I saw the first penis in my life. It belonged to Edward Young, and although it couldn't have been particularly large, while big for his age, he was still only 11 years old, it looked enormous, being erect and in possession of Susan Flaherty's much smaller, chubby white hand. I say first penis because while I've probably seen scores before, without that single quality of erection, which made the organ a sexual instrument, they had been anything but impressive. We usually called it a wee-wee. The, <laughs> the double diminutive decreasing its importance. And when we used it to urinate, that same word was again used, meaning in the symbology of words, that was its only admitted function. <laughs> what Edward possessed and what Susan in turn possessed of Edward was anything but a wee-wee. <laughs> it was in my older brother's overheard and until then uncomprehended terminology, clearly a boner. Edward himself was now an appendage to it. As Susan slowly raised and lowered her loose fist over its limb, all pretense of kissing gone, Edward twisted and squirmed as he lay back on the pillow in helpless thrall to this object Su that Susan had somehow or other managed to find and extract from his trousers. Amazed, Karen and I stopped kissing and turned to watch. So did Beth and George. Our <laughs> eyes, our still learning minds, focusing first on Susan's hand and then on Edward's face as he moaned softly, reddened, whitened, read it again, reddened again, lift up his head, it seemed involuntary, from the pillow, his eyes glazed and almost popping out of their sockets before he let out a guttural cry, fell back onto the pillow again and managed to pull Susan's hand away. Still moaning, he quickly rolled over onto his front as though shot or stabbed. And to our stupefaction, he attempted to crawl away. When Edward finally got to his feet, he was still almost doubled over. He looked at Susan with a look I couldn't figure out. She continued to sit primly, looking at her hand with an almost abstracted stare and with no little satisfaction. Edward lurched off to the basement lavatory. George and I jumped after him. After a few minutes of our knocking and calling, Edward unlocked the lavatory door and let us in. He was sitting on the closed toilet seat. His handsome face was very white, but gaining color. Are you okay? George, his closer friend, asked. Yeah, Edward's voice seemed to have gotten deep, deeper. I'm okay. What happened? What'd she do to you? <laughs> you don't know? Edward looked at us. It was clear we didn't have an idea. She made me come. George and I stared at each other in ignorance. Then it occurred to the both of us at the same time. I asked first, you mean that was sex? <laughs> Edward nodded. It's supposed to be inside her when it happens, but all the same, that was it. <laughs> all three of us were silent with implications. Did it really hurt a lot, I asked? <laughs> sure it did, but in a nice way, too. Know what I mean? We didn't. <laughs> we didn't of all that we had known and experienced, something either felt nice or it hurt, period. Is it still, George hesitated, a boner? 
Nah, it's regular now. <laughs> he took it out of his pants and showed it to us. Sure enough, once again, it was merely a wee wee. <laughs> it did not look damaged in any way. <laughs> a few minutes later, after we'd run out of questions, we three boys emerged from the bathroom. The pillows had been placed back in a single pile against one wall. The three girls were all buttoned up, sitting in the on the overstuffed sofa, playing a game of old maid as though nothing had happened. Little was said to us, and in the guilty silence, we boys made our escape. <laughs> Oh, are you done? Or are you, no, done. I'm not rushing you. No, okay, I mean, Maybe, I mean, everybody, the brilliant Felice Picano. Thank you. I think you know more about what happened to the book, but it's late. It's, you know, read the preface. I put it's, you, Felice, I put you at the end so we wouldn't feel like you were, you were rushed. I, either, so. I, I could read a little bit more about what happened after it had been burned on the docks. Yeah, yeah, which is in the preface here. Oops. Oddly, the book, okay, I was astounded by this fact that it had been banned. I was astounded at the same time, I was very pleased. I'd never been censored before. Having a book censored means something. It means that you have deeply offended one or more people who felt that they needed to protect unsuspecting readers from your inflammatory words, thoughts, and images. I've been nominated for important literary awards. I had a few bestsellers. My books have been translated, but nothing like this had ever truly satisfied me that I was having any real effect as a writer. Oddly, the book was already selling in the UK. Earlier shipments had just slammed by. It was even reviewed in The Guardian, not a minor journal. True, the reviews were deeply unintelligent. <laughs> Mr. Picano, the reviewer, instructed, children do not have sex. <laughs> I, of course, wrote back suggesting the reviewer check his hefty Oxford English Dictionary for the definition of the word memoir. I had written a memoir showing middle-class children on Long Island having sex, hetero, homo, with dripping chocolate, and with airplane glue as stimulants, ergo, <laughs> children to have sex. <laughs> I photocopied the Queen's letter and sent it to my business partners and then to almost everyone I knew. I had it framed and for years had it displayed. In the dozen or so residential moves since then, it's become hopelessly lost. Alas, no worries, because apparently my ability to offend was only just beginning. <laughs> Both the new joy of gay sex and its revision for the internet, the Joy of Gay Sex third edition, were censored, banned, and protested again. Given the US's strong Puritan bias, those reactions to gay sex were expected from the beginning. But exactly what got people so riled up about ambidextrous? The five publishers my literary agent sent it to refused it, despite my terrific record. The answer is probably what the conformist Guardian reviewer hit on the head when he wrote about it. Children don't have sex, at least not with each other, or so the public was supposed to believe. Children only have sex when assaulted by perverted adults. I'd already published a story in which a 10-year-old boy who didn't even know what sex was had a sensual relationship with the grown young man, a relationship in which the boy was not only the initiator, but also the person in full control. Like ambidextrous, that was based on something that happened to me. It was only when the young man involved realized how he was being utilized and that it could lead to something criminal that he ended the relationship, as well as the job that brought him in contact with the boy. All of that goes in against the general hypocritical adult view that children are completely innocent. Whatever that word really means. Contrary, Rice, there's a reason why books like Lord of the Flies, A High Wind in Jamaica, and now a batch of one YA novels are so popular among young readers. They show not only how not innocent children are, but exactly how far children will go. Mm -hmm. 
one rejecting editor was so incensed that he added that the book was unpatriotic. Oh, We're talking yeah, about yeah. 1983, not, not long after the ignominious U.S. pullout of Vietnam. Another offered me 10 grand not to publish it. <laughs> and then I talk a little bit more about it. Um, and then I say here later on, while reading my Wikipedia entry a few years ago, I was surprised to see that of all my books, Ambidextrous had its own small wiki page. When people ask me what my favorite books uh, is, my books is, uh, that I've written, I always say the one I'm working on. But Ambidextrous has a special place in my heart because of how it came about and what it accomplished for me as a uh, writer. And what it accomplished for me is that it helped me find my voice. Up until that point, I had been writing novels in the more or less Flaubertian third person sense. And even though I'd done a great deal of experimenting with them, uh, one of the books had uh, two different narrators unevenly. Another was told from a, uh, the lure is told from the point of view of what I call the camera on the shoulder. You are only, you think that it's third person, but you're only seeing and hearing and feeling what he is. Um, something that I developed that other people have taken up, I'm happy to say. Um, but this was the first time uh, that I had done it this way. And I had written this for my, uh, for my partner, Bob Lowe, now deceased, because when I told him things about my childhood, he said, nobody's had a childhood like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You've got to write it up. So I wrote up the first part, the basement games for him. And then he said, well, you're still only 11 years old. What happened next? The <laughs> second part. And that involved uh, a, a, a lovely young boy and a bicycle race, which is what I often read because it's just people have said that bicycle races, unlike anything anybody's ever written. Um, and so I sometimes read that as a piece of action. And then, the, and that was about my homosexual relationship with the boy Ricky. And then the third one uh, is called The Effective Mirrors. And it was about, I wrote about this uh, situation with this woman and her father, who I found out through a series of mirrors and glasses was watching us have sex. And when I, which I didn't know until I one day we were doing something. So, and we were getting increasingly kinky. And we were 13 at the time. Right? And um, and she was sort of suggesting the kinkiness. And so I was involved in this weird three-way relationship that I knew nothing about. And I wrote it up as a story for a, a contest, a citywide writing contest, and really tamped it way, way down. And it was still rejected. And people said, the people who rejected it said, this must have been plagiarized. And nobody your age could write a story like that or could understand all the motivations that were taking place. So there are some copies in the back of me if you would like to read more about it. And thank you very much. Elise Picano, this has uh, been a great pleasure. Um, so finally, uh, remember to support the Publishing Triangle, support the Bureau of General Services Queer Division. Remember that we'll be back three weeks from today with another eight great writers. And uh, remember that our um, annual award ceremony is on April 17th. And don't go because there are books back there that Greg and Donnie want to sell you. And there are authors here that want to sign their books. Um, so remember to be supportive. Oh, and finally, thank you, Kate Rounds. Thank you, Felice Picano. Thank you, Carol Rosenfeld. Thank you, Jerome Allison Murphy. Thank you, Dan Meltz. Thank you, Lisa Gitlin. And thank you, Kathy Wolf, back in DC. Great evening. Thank you, everybody. And uh, remember, these live forever on YouTube, so spread the word there, too. Thank you. Night, everyone. <laughs> ah.